it is now my pleasure to introduce to you an aviator's aviator. This is Pete Bunce, who is the president of Gamma. He's a 26-year veteran of the United States Air Force, where he flew uh, F-15s and A-10s, and he's going to give us uh, his unique, uh, if you will, like perspective on the state of our industry and some rule changes. So round of applause for Pete Bunce, please, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Thornton. First of all, who is this guy? When this was in my mailbox, I took a look at it. I said, this is the answer to Professor Marinelli's question. Because we separated the officers and enlisted, because when colonels like me were teaching lieutenants how to bat hang and drink Jeremiah weed on a Friday night in the officers club, this is what we looked like on Saturday morning. Now, when I asked other people about this, you know, there were other things that came to mind, like definitely he did something wrong. Or when you read and you actually looked at the magazine and you kind of looked up at the top, you say, unnecessary roughness? Yeah, it could have been one of those nights. Because those of you that know Jerry know that you can have this wonderful evening with Jerry and Stephanie at, the, at their home and you have wonderful wine and, and you're drinking there. And about the time you just can't stay up anymore, Jerry goes, oh, I'm gonna go write code for a couple hours. And that's probably what he looks like the next morning. But in all actuality, when Craig Fuller put this into the Flight Training Magazine last year, what is it all about? It's game changer. And that's what we're all here for. You know, we're here and all of those companies are sponsoring this and people can attend this for free, why? Because Jerry and the team at Redbird have decided they're gonna change this game. And they're gonna bring so many things that a lot of us that had the privilege of serving in the military and having advanced simu simulator technology go into our training, try to bring that down into the light end of general aviation, for why? To improve our safety record. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today and just see where we are, see where we're going, and then talk a little bit about the silliness in Washington that keeps us all awake at night. So let's first of all look at a sobering statistic. We've all seen this before, obviously, but when you look at that age and the average age is over 48 years old, you go, wow. Combine that with the number of pilot starts that we're all aware of, Couple that with what's happened in the flight hours in the piston category. Again, not a pretty story. What's the reason for that? A lot of it is the cost of avgas. And the Redbird experiment earlier in the month of October definitely showed what we can do if we can bring that price back down. And now we look at new aircraft entering the system. Now, look at how many aircraft we produced back in the 70s, late 70s, and 80s. We were able to get the small aircraft revitalized, or actually we were able to get GERA, uh, General Aviation um, Recovery Act, together so that we could go and start producing these aircraft again. But are we ever going to get back to that type of heyday in the certified world? No. Nah. Not, there's reasons for that. But what's happening in the amateur built world? You know, I've got my great friend Jack Pelton here. We're gonna talk a little bit about what innovation we have in the amateur built world and why is that so popular right now? Average age of certified aircraft out there, 40 plus years old. So if the average age is 40, think about the differential in technology from what we have in the Red Hawk outside of here and what we have of those aircraft that are 40 plus. And what are we doing to be able to bring modern technology into those older aircraft so that younger people get excited about them? Last year, if you were, you were at this conference, we talked a little bit about Part 23 and what happened. But as we produced aircraft out there, I want you to look at the cost in, prog in progression over time. As we got to that iconic 172 and 56, 
little over $8,000, pretty much the curve from the 40s was staying on a line toward inflation. And even as we go to the 1960s and we look at some of the great aircraft that were produced during that time, yeah, the margins were decent for the manufacturers, but you look at the price, yeah, pretty much on a standard curve toward inflation. Yeah, something's starting to happen to the curve in here right in the 70s. One of the reasons here, and we can track all of this, is the society we live in, it's a very litigious society, lawsuits started to happen. And what else did we start to have? We started to have the FAA start to promulgate more and more rules, making it tougher and tougher to certify. But this would have been a good news story if it stayed there. But now look what happened. Right here, in the 80s and the 90s, what happened to the curve? It went exponential. What's the reason for that? Well, during that period of time, and if you plot this up and then compare it to your standard inflation curve, something went wrong. The FAA, during this period of time, promulgated 800 rules. 800 rules for the certification of Part 23 aircraft. What did we do? Part 23 runs up to 12,500 pounds, so we said a tube and fabric airplane has to be certified to the same standards that a light business jet that flies up at altitude has to be pressurized, has to ha fly in RVSM airspace. At that time, it, we didn't have RVSM, but it has to be a very uh, complex machine. We certified it all to the highest common denominator, driving costs up astronomically. And you look at where we can get into aircraft today, and it is cost prohibitive. So we have this giant fleet that's getting older and older. Why? Because it's very difficult for people to get into new aircraft. Well, we needed to do something about it because there are a lot of barriers to new aircraft production. When we talk about cost, we talk about regulations. All those 800 regulations now have laid dormant. So what do you get? You get the county option of every aircraft certification officer, manager out there, or engineer that works within the FAA says, no, nope, you're gonna do it this way. And so you're trying to produce a, an aircraft out there, and I know a lot of my friends that are here that are part of the manufacturing community, you know, you could talk to R.J. Siegel back, back there who's working for Kestrel, he's dealing with that right now, trying to bring on a new aircraft, dealing with this myriad of regulations. Some of them have never been kept current. And so you get these county options, you get interpretations out there. And then the regulations are overly prescriptive. Even if they don't apply in today's world, they're so prescriptive that it doesn't give you flexibility. So we decided we needed to do something about that. At the same time, though, we had to look at the certified fleet that's out there today, the one that we're not recapitalizing quickly, and say, what are we going to do about it? So when we look at general aviation accidents, and this is a, a compilation of both fixed wing and rotorcraft, we're not getting any better. When you look at this part of the curve, after we had a fairly nice progress down to about the turn of the century, we're stabilized. We are not improving in our safety record. Now, are we always going to have accidents? Yes. We're always going to have car accidents. We're always going to have aircraft accidents. But what have we done in automotive technology? We've allowed people to walk away from a pretty severe accident, whether it's bumpers that can handle the accident, airbags, good restraints, capabilities that give them situational awareness about pulling into the wrong lane or, or even backing up. We've given technology and we've reduced the number of fatalities due to automo automobile accidents down. We are always going to have general aviation accidents, but when people can walk away from them, that's what's important. You know, Those of us that have been flying for a while, any landing is a good landing as long as you walk away from it. Well, there you go. We want people to, be, to have a survivable airframe. So a lot of you have seen the Pareto chart, and you've seen where our accidents come from. This is on the fixed wing side. And the first thing that we as an industry attacked a couple years ago, and what did we do? We copied what the airlines did. Now, all of us in the aviation industry need to be proud of what the airlines have been able to accomplish. Basically before San Francisco happened, and that was not with a US trained air crew, we don't have fatalities anymore. Knock on any wood you can find out there, but we have done well. Why? Because of CAST, the Commercial Aviation Safety Team, 
and the work that industry and government did together to be able to do predictive analysis and be able to put it back into the system. We had not done that in general aviation. So we developed the GAJSC, copied after CAS, the Joint Aviation uh, S General Aviation Steering uh, Committee, to be able to go and look at the accidents. The first thing we, we went into was loss of control. Look at that number. This is huge. And of course, this is divided up into piston, turbine, and jets. That's a big number. The next one over is CFIT. After we went and, and did loss of control, we looked at CFIT and said, wait, this is 2000, up to 2011 data. We went back and tracked from the beginning of time when we started to put glass panel technology into cockpits, and we said, CFIT is going away. And if you start to project and you actually look at the numbers that haven't been published by the FAA and look at 12 and 13, where we are today, CFIT is starting to go away. Why? Because we're giving situational awareness. We're giving technology to people in the cockpits, whether they're using a handheld portable iPad device or whether they've got it embedded in the panel. So we went to the next one. We went to power plant. And we said, let's start to do work there. At the same time, anybody that pays attention and, and is a great or a member of that great organization, EAA, there was, there was an NTSB report that came out about the safety of uncertified or amateur built aircraft. And what did Jack do? Jack put some attention to it. He put a friend of mine, Charlie Precourt, another F-15 pilot, by the way, and also former chief astronaut at NASA, and said, Charlie, work on this. Work on safety here. And the proof is in the pudding, and Jack will be able to tell you about that tonight. But we're proud of that when we go and focus as an industry on a problem, focus on training, focus on information, and focus on how to use technology, we can go and make a change. So we're working on power plant, and then we're going to keep going to each and every one of these down the, down the line. When you switch over to helicopters, again, loss of control is a big one. The second category is other, it's dogs and cats, but CFIT is still significant in the rotorcraft community. So when I go down to the rotorcraft directorate in Fort Worth from DC and start to talk to them, and I get a mentality that says, well, these helicopters are supposed to fly VFR. So if we give them the same type of panel technology that you've done in part 23 fixed wing, they might fly IFR. That's the, that's the mentality that we have to deal with out there. And we've got to break this paradigm. Yeah, when you're flying at night in a helicopter and you run into a fog bank that you may not be able to see because there's no light out there, wouldn't you want a helicopter pilot to have good situational awareness with a nice panel? So these are, these are the types of paradigms that we have to break down out there. So this Joint Steering Committee has a goal on both rotorcraft and fixed wing side of driving that accident rate down to 1.0. And we're attacking that hard. But how do we get at safety within the, the established fleet that's out there? We not only have to be able to allow certification of new aircraft to have modern standards, standards that keep up with the pace of technology, but we, we need to be able to facilitate people buying very cost effectively that technology to put it into the current platforms that are out there. And that's why we've gone with part 23. And let me give you an example of putting that technology into aircraft that are currently out there. One of the manufacturer's tasks that came out of this first analysis of the GAJSC looking at loss of control, which is our, our biggest area of concern on the fixed wing side, we said, if we had the technology that the military has had for years and business aviation has for years, they just fly on the wing, AOA. Why haven't we had that in general aviation so long when it's so effective? Well, people got religion, and they got religion very quickly. So in some of Garmin's new systems that they have coming out there, we've got AOA. Bendix King, we've got Kevin Gould here from Bendix King, introduced it at Oshkosh. And the aircraft that, that we built, the amateur built aircraft that we built with the kids in the uh, Build-A-Plane competition this last summer up at Glass Air, we put one of Kevin's AOA gauges in it. And this is just fantastic technology that we can use to help people. And then, of course, in the amateur built or the, the uh, light sport category, we have Icon came out with theirs, a real interesting display where you truly are looking at the wing the whole time and also Dynon, another fantastic company in the amateur built world that's providing this technology out there. But one of our impediments 
is that the FAA, in their infinite wisdom, has said, okay, well, you guys, you can have this AOA out there, and we know it's going to save lives. We know that it's going to going to help with the loss of control, and we know, because we were on those committees with you in the GAJSC, that this is good. But all of a sudden it goes into that FAA bureaucracy and it starts to hash around, and all of a sudden it said, but even though you can put it in an amateur-built aircraft and we know it works, you got to TSO it if it goes into commercial or goes into certified aircraft. So what does that do? That all of a sudden drives the cost up dramatically, because it, through a at least year-long certification cycle for this simple piece of technology, it's going to cost several million dollars, and of course the manufacturer has to recoup that in, the, in their sales costs. And then what does that do? It drives the price up so high that nobody will, will buy it to retrofit an aircraft. They say, I don't, I don't need it for that cost. And all of a sudden we have defeated what we were trying to do in safety because of FAA bureaucracy and the kind of thinking that we have out there. This is madness. So we said we need to do something about it. So we got together and we looked at part 23 and we said we have got to be able to have a way to produce modern aircraft using modern technology, those that are available to amateur built aircraft, get it in a certified aircraft and also allow people to retrofit. So we had a tremendous rulemaking committee that all got together. Everybody got on board, not only FAA and industry, but we brought in international regulators, EASA, the New Zealand folks, folks from Australia, ANAC in Brazil, even the CAAC in China, all to be part of this because we want to do international rulemaking. It worked its way through the sausage making machine and we've been able to go ahead and work part 23, have the ARC report out and we deliver this report to the FAA said we have to do this. And the FAA got so excited about it when they first said yep this is right that the FAA administrator went to Wichita, talked to the Wichita Aero Club last year and said, this is, this is really good stuff. Twice the safety at half the cost. The FAA coined that term. Now that's twice the safety at half the cost to industry and to government. And what better thing to have happen at a time when we really have a fiscal mess on our hands and we're really going to have some terrible things that are going to come down the pike here for general aviation due to sequestration. So, the FAA administrator embraced this, but then it got into the bureaucracy. And what happened? The bureaucracy got a hold of it, and the FAA legal said, oh, too far a sweeping change. We can't do this. Now, think about this. The premise of this whole thing is we were going to do international rulemaking, and then every year, or actually twice a year, we would get FAA, EASA, ANAC, CAC officials together with industry and said, okay, We've got this new capability out there, new technology. Let's look at it. Here are methods of compliance that, that a manufacturer can produce. Pull it off the shelf and say, for this, whether it's structure, this for power plant, this I want for avionics, depending on the complexity of the aircraft that they're, that they're building, and they can pick off that menu. Said, so this is great. The FAA legal said, no, it's too hard to do. So what we say, we just said, forget it. We went to the United States Congress, and we started what's called the Small Aircraft Revitalization Act. I'll talk about that in a second. But it just wasn't embraced by the FAA. It was embraced overseas. The new head of EASA in Cologne, Patrick Key, just came out this week, as reported, say, we are going to get this done, and we're going to get it done in 18 months because it's the right thing to do. But where did the FAA get religion? They got religion with the Small Aircraft Revitalization Act because they got the message because when 411 members of the House of Representatives and no opposition says, yep, we need to do this, goes over to the Senate side, and all of a sudden the Senate says unanimously, yep, we've got to get this done. And oh, by the way, FAA, you're going to get it done by the end of the year, calendar year uh, 2015. That's going to make a difference. It makes the FAA do what they don't want to do. But it's the right thing to do for the industry. This bill will soon become law. Right now, amazingly enough, my staff uh, reported to me last night, we, we've been working this. Our, our sponsor for the bill is Mr. Pompeo, who represents Wichita, Kansas in the House. And the way we orchestrated this, and, and uh, my staff I'm, I'm extremely proud of, we balanced equal number of Republicans and Democrats in the House side. So we had co-sponsors out the yin-yang in the House. That's why it sailed through. We went over to the Senate. The Senate is democratically controlled. We went to Cirrus and said, help us get Senator Klobuchar to sponsor it. We get Senator Klobuchar to work with her colleagues, equal number of Republicans and Democrats on it. We get it through. Well, amazingly enough, it's been so successful 
that the speaker called last night and said, we're going to kind of do something and use this as a poster child of how we want to do legislation for the rest of this Congress. And so it's going to be a little bit delayed as we go back and send another bill over to the Senate with a different number, which will be in a sequence. So it's a very interesting situation that's going on there. But that is because we've been successful because we've been wrapping our arms around safety. And that was, that's what's important to us. Now, Mark Baker talked last night about some of the things that are going on in Washington, and I wanted just to give you an idea of what things are, are what we're working, what type of regulatory things uh, we may be facing in the weeks ahead. This is obviously the aerial view of this crazy place we call DC, but we'll start across the river in Virginia over at TSA. Now, we've been working with TSA for quite a few years. After 9-11, the agency gets, basically stands up and all of a sudden, they were able to throw out a whole bunch of edicts. They didn't have to do rulemaking in the way that any government agency is supposed to do rulemaking. They had to come up, and at first, they just issued edicts. And then all of a sudden, they said, oh, on, on longer range type of projects, we actually have to do rulemaking. And they really don't know how to do that. And that's why we got the large aircraft security program the way it was. And those of you that can think back maybe about five years ago now, remember that we were being told that on certain aircraft out there, that we can't even carry tools on board that we use. A farmer can't have a, uh, any type of aircraft, like a King Air or any, any turboprop out there, that he can go from his farm to farm with farm implements on board because, oh, that would be unsafe. And we pushed back on the, just the silliness, and we were able to get them to stop. But now that regulation is languished there. So where are we in general aviation? You all remember that crazy that took the Cherokee and flew flew into the IRS building here in Austin the other day. We were so close. We were this close to have an overreaction from Congress to that event when, when seriously, we saw a light general aviation aircraft imp impact a wood structure and do very minimal damage. But we're vulnerable right now without the ability to have a logic, common sense, large aircraft security program out there that addresses the issue that the Department of Homeland Security cares about, cares about, and that's throw weight. They care about a 9-11 type of scenario where a fully loaded jet with a lot of potential energy can go and slam into the side of a building and throw a whole bunch of gas and light it on fire. So we've given them a lot of analysis to show them what, what we can do, but now we've got to get the rule out. And we can get some good things with this rule. We actually can get a capability so that we can fly into airspace when there's a presidential TFR. Do you know what happens to Chicago executive when the president is in town, we shut him down. And yet you can have this young, young pilot flying for a commuter airline that has every, every right in the world to fly through there. Why don't we have that? We need to change that, that paradigm out there. So we're working with TSA on that. We're also working to be able to have our repair stations, our worldwide repair stations, have a modern regime for inspection. Let's go over to EPA. We all know. We've been talking a lot the last several years about unleaded avgas and the need for us to transition. The EPA, surprisingly enough, has been our friend over the last several years, have, have beat back the friends of the earth that basically said, ban it, we don't care. We, we just want it banned. So the EPA has said, OK, well, let's let industry work it. They went over to the FAA and said, this is your baby, you work it. FAA, I, I can still remember two years ago, we were uh, all together, Craig and Jack and I were, were together up at Oshkosh, and we were all in a room and with an FAA administrator that said, first time he's ever at Oshkosh, and all of a sudden he's confronted with us, to, pretty much demanding that he carve money out of his budget to be able to produce a program where we can transition online at Avgas. And to his credit, he said, yep, we're going to support it. And so we've been able to establish a program where actually we have to certify fuel. We have never done that before. We've always certified engines that can run on different blends of fuel, but never the fuel itself. So we're working that through the system. We're making progress there, but are still, what's going to happen with the price of that fuel? Right now, we're down to seven different refiners at nine different refineries in North America. What if that fuel is not industrialized to, to the capacity that it costs more than current fuel Avgas does out there today? Is it viable? When we know that a lot of people aren't flying because of the cost of fuel. So that it's very fragile out there. And so that's why when we're working on things like putting diesel engines in aircraft, that is one very good alternative, although we even have to pay attention to that. 
because as we convert to alternative fuels, and remember that the goals for all of pit turbine aviation is for jet fuel by 2020 to have alternative fuels in place because we have to have carbon neutral growth by 2020. Otherwise, we have major market-based measures that go into effect. When you put alternative fuels in there, you change the chemical composition of the fuel that's in the tank. And one day you might have 10% alternative fuels and 90% petroleum-based. It may be opposite at the next FBO you go to or the next fueling site for the airlines. And cetane is an issue there. So we have to pay attention to that and how we're going to deal with that. And the EPA is, is actually working with us in that regard. Department of Commerce. We've got some significant issues going on the international front. We just found out last week out at the NBA convention that the Brazilians are talking about Im implementing basically what's called, what would be called a luxury tax here. But on the automotive side, they have a 4% uh, of the value of the vehicle per year tax. They tried to implement that on aviation. It went up to their Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, nope, that's, that's only allowed for automobiles. And so they're actually, they're, the government's trying to make a constitutional change to allow an automobile to be categorized as also an aircraft. 4% a year on the value of airplanes will kill a very new growing industry in the country of Brazil. And we have this going on all over the world. So the Department of Commerce, we enlist their help with to be able to go and try to discuss with other governments. We can't dictate what their tax policy is, but we can help them understand the negative ramifications when you do something like that. We also have our Department of Commerce helping us with the XM Bank because people think of XM Bank as fin financing just Boeing aircraft. But I'm here to tell you, our ag aircraft out there, Thrush and Air Tractor, the two major producers, rely on XM financing almost entirely for their export financing, and that's where they're growing most dramatically. Department of State. We're working with state right now to be able to go and put meat on the bones of an initiative we call the APEC Business Aviation Initiative. Right now in the Asian Pacific region, we all know that's a vast region of the planet, we treat business aviation, general aviation, like we do commercial aviation. We don't differentiate in the rules. And all of us know that the way that general aviation and business aviation thrives is when you treat it differently. You don't apply the same rules that you do on the commercial side. And so our Department of State is helping us lead this effort by soliciting other governments like the Japanese, the Canadians, even the Russians, to be able to take a look at this and say, hey, let's go and try to regulate it differently and be able to get great development out there for countries. Think of Indonesia, thousands upon thousands of islands that they have to tie together. The purchases that Lion Air is doing right now from Boeing just to get a, a modernized 737 fleet in that country is phenomenal. You look at Philippines, the same thing, many, many islands. They've got to tie these islands together in something that makes economic sense, and it isn't taking a slow ferry between each one of those. So the potential for general aviation in the Asia Pacific region is tremendous in addition to all the BRIC countries that you hear us talk about a lot. NASA. One of the things that Administrator Golden is doing right now, and those of you know him, uh, he's a Marine Corps fighter pilot, he's, he will very vocally tell you we have just neglected the first day in NASA. That Aeronautics A has been so absolutely downtrodden in that agency that really all the money that goes to is keep lights on. Fundamental research to help in the aeronautics has been waning and he wants to reinvigorate that. So there's outreach that we have continually now with general aviation say, what do you want us to work on? What can we help you with? And one of the things that we are trying to leverage is also the technology that we are getting into unmanned aerial vehicles. Because we know that tsunami is coming but we also know that we can leverage off of the technology that we're going to get out of these vehicles to plug it back into general aviation. Wouldn't you love a capability, any airplane that has an autopilot on, if you have an engine problem, all of a sudden just hit a button that takes me to an airfield at the proper glide speed while I work the engine problem and can get into the checklist. That technology is out there today. We have a full capability of doing things like that. But we, we, there is a great potential leverage, and NASA is trying to be our friends with that. DOT, we have a new Secretary of Transportation in place, and one of the first things he was faced with as Secretary in the aviation world 
is the close down of the government and the close, closure of the registry, but also a basic stop to all certification activities. Jerry told me last night that the second Red Hawk out there was virtually stopped right at the end of the process because all of a sudden folks couldn't work. But during this process, we were able to talk to Secretary Fox and say, hey, this industry is important. We were able to quantify the number of transactions that could not happen because the registry was closed. And all of a sudden he said, boy, that's a lot of money out there. We're talking billions of dollars in transactions. That's billions of dollars of tax revenue that is not available to the federal government. And so he took notice. And so we took the opportunity to say, hey, we also need you to come with us on, on one of the rallies that we have. We, we as the manufacturers go around the country and have great rallies. In fact, my favorite one was with the previous Secretary of Transportation. Jack hosted it when he was the head of Cessna in his hangar, but we had Beechcraft and we had Lear all in there, packed hangar full. And when the optic of a Secretary of Transportation looking out at a hangar full of people and having to talk to them about how important their jobs are to the economy of this great nation, that is an important optic. And we do that at states all around the country. And the next one we have going, and I hope that any of you that live in this part of the country will be with us December 6th at Love Field in Bombardier's hangar when we do our next rally. And at Love Field, it's a great one. We have Dallas Aeromotive, Bombardier, Gulfstream, Jet Aviation, and several others. So we have thousands of, of manufacturing employees. But any of you that can come to be in that hangar and celebrate general aviation, because I tell you, it works. We talked, Mark Baker talked the other night about the importance of general aviation caucus. One of the reasons that we get people to join the caucus is we talk about how important this industry is to jobs in this country. And when somebody has to have their staff research how many jobs and what kind of quality jobs they are and talk to a hangar full of people, that really makes a difference. So we keep those going. Okay, FAA. Administrator Werta now has uh, a deputy administrator, Mike Whitaker, working for him, and also a uh, former Brigadier General or Major General from the United States Air Force uh, working the next gen, basically his next gen science implementation officer in place. So he's got his team now coalesced. At the same time, he's got to face this daunting task of what he's going to do with sequestration. Now, those of you that are betting people, I would say if, if you bet routinely, you're probably going to bet that we are not going to find a solution to the economic mess that we are in before January 15th happens. What is the, what is the way that we are going to get out of it? There isn't any. So what, what it is is we are stuck with sequestration because it's the path of least resistance for both parties that are now dug in. So now with sequestration, each line item that is in the federal budget is required to have a cut in it. So the FAA administrator is faced with some tough choices. And that's why Mark Baker last night was talking to you about the fact that we, as the Washington-based General Aviation Association, have gotten together and said we can no longer just go along and say no. We can't say no to everything. But what we can say is don't go doing something crazy like implement a user fee or just whack certain programs that have great impact on us as, as general aviation people for the sake of just make, making the bottom line. Let's do some cuts smartly. And that's why Mark talked about VORs. Can we have a minimum VOR network? Do we still have to invest in ILS technology out there if in certain parts of the country the weather never, never gets below GPS minimums? Can we, can we really cut back on the maintenance of those? Can we close down towers smartly? So that if we have a low activity tower, whether it's contract or whether it's a traditional FAA tower, if it's low activity, can we remote it? They're doing it in Norway and Sweden. And in fact, they're doing it so effectively that the cameras that they use actually are better than the Mark I eyeballs that we use in, in towers. And can we do it also at night? We added a second controller at night. Why? Because we had the first controller fall asleep. Why? Because it wasn't an active activity. Can we not remote? A few of those just at the nighttime, so there's enough activity that we can make proper use out of the controllers. Can we consolidate? Do we really need 21 centers out there right now? And we have somebody at NATCA, the union that, that works for the controllers, that's willing to talk about that. So there's smart things that we can do on the side of the FAA to save money. Mark talked about what we can do with flight service. He also talked about what EAA and AOPA are doing with, with the aeromedical uh, as far as the class three physical. On the manufacturing side, we can do tremendous 
gain in efficiency by doing the same thing we want to do with Part 23 in rotorcraft, Part 27, 29, Part 25 transport category aircraft, and just allow us to use the delegation authorities as manufacturers that Congress has already given us, but the FAA doesn't want to give up. So there's tremendous efficiencies that can be gained. When we go to the White House, it's still interesting. Uh, I'm here to tell you, personal opinion, I think that the, the White House is still playing enough politics out there that they, want, they wanted to make this shutdown as painful as they could on industry to be able to put the Republicans behind the eight ball. And this thing still has many chapters to play out as we, as we lead up to January 15th. The one thing with the debt ceiling, though, that problem we probably won't see again because very smartly what Mitch McConnell did on the, on the Republican side is they basically put in a provision in this last crisis fix that they put in place that said the only way you can say that we are not going to increase the debt ceiling is if Congress takes a positive vote to say no. Right now, up to this point, they had to say yes to a debt ceiling increase. Now they have to say no. That's a fundamental change. But we still, the government is only funded through a CR through January 15th. So th this has several more chapters to play out in the White House. So it's a dynamic time in Washington. When we look at sequestration and what's facing us, our hope is that the FAA will engage in dialogue with us as a general aviation community and say, OK, we know we can't make all those savings that you may be proposing on consolidation and other things right away, but let's see where we can smartly take the cuts that won't be debilitating to our industry and we can keep this industry growing. Because what we're doing here today, what all of us are committed to is bringing more people in the industry. It's young people, it's people with disposable incomes, it's people that all of a sudden their kids are graduated from college and they have money out there and they wanna be able to go and do something. It's that aviator that sits there and says, I love this cool technology, but I can't afford that expensive certified aircraft, so I'm gonna go build my amateur build aircraft, but I want a quick build kit, but I wanna have the performance out there. We love each and every one of those individuals. My wife, 55 years old, learned to fly last year. She loves it, she's a passionate advocate for it. But as I went and watched her go, went through this program, I said, gosh, we're really still doing that? We're really teaching somebody how to use a slide ruler? You know, when you think about an EA-6B, it's just slide ruler, okay. In 2013, the FAA is requiring us to do this. We have to push the FAA to enter this century, okay? We're allowed to fly with iPads to be able to have approach plates in it, but yet we're still talking about wasting time on an EA-6B. We, we as a community have to say enough of this, and we have to get, we're working collectively, and I know a lot of you in this room have been working on the, on the test standards with the FAA. But there are some just entrenched Neanderthals in that agency that do not want to change. And how do we embrace technology if the FAA, our regulator, won't do it? So we have to be able to get together as a common voice, decide which way we want to go, and be able to appeal to that young person, that old person, those, those folks out there that just say, I can really do that because flying is cool. And then let us share our passion. And then once they walk in the door, we need to keep them. You know, because once they get in that door, if all of a sudden they go through a few lessons and go, ah, this isn't fun, or this may be too challenging, or whatever reason it is, we've got to figure out how to keep them. Because if we just did that, if we only did that, we'd be able to go and stem that hemorrhaging that we see on, on the flight training side. So I appreciate the chance to come talk to you. And I, I am just an enthusiastic supporter of, of this conference, everything that you're all doing. And again, my hat is off to Jerry and his team for just the phenomenal job they do down here at Redbird. Let's keep it going. Thank you. Thank you, Pete.